um, what do I think about modern composition for the organ? Well, um, I think the organ is an amazing instrument. Um, for centuries, it's inspired composers and musicians and non-musicians alike. Um, and my feeling is that um, there's been quite an upsurge in recent years for composition for the instrument. And I'm delighted about that. Um, I love playing new music on the organ. Um, I think that um, the organ's traditional kind of, um, uh, the, the way that it's traditionally been thought of has been an instrument that um, is very much based in the church, which of course is correct and true. Um, but I've always thought also that the instrument is um, very well suited to the concert hall and um, uh, as an instrument to play uh, real concert music. So um, I'm delighted to be someone that does that. And um, I try to do as much as I possibly can um, and look forward to what the future brings. So if Bach was the organ rock star of the Baroque, who is his equivalent today? Um, that's a tough question to answer, but of course the closest person is Cameron Carpenter, who has he uh, has many um, uh, many different ways of uh, expressing himself through the instrument, um, uh, and I guess that's it. Uh, do I think there's an audience for modern organ compositions? Well, I think, yes, there is. Um, as long as there's an inquisitive, um, interesting, uh, imaginative audience out there for new music, then they will be open to hearing the instrument um, that perhaps they don't know very much about. So, um, I would not think about it as there being an audience ready-made for the organ and for modern organ compositions. I would probably think about it more as um, reaching out to people who perhaps wouldn't necessarily know about the organ um, and not necessarily knowing, uh, not necessarily thinking about it as an instrument to listen to in its own right. Um, and you'd be surprised at the similarities with the organ and um, the synthesized music of the 1960s and 70s um, and I've been really interested in that kind of uh, um, uh, dialogue as well um, I get asked this question a lot um, and I guess um, I would say that the most special place for me um, when I think back of all the places that I played is um, probably St Paul's Cathedral and the instrument there is so spectacular. Um, listening to that instrument in the flesh is one of the most amazing experiences that um, that you can have really from an oral musical perspective. Um, it's such an amazing building and such an amazing instrument. Um, the instrument is placed around the cathedral um, in various different locations um, and uh, to sit under the dome to listen to it is is really spectacular and uh, it's really an instrument that fills the space and fits the space perfectly so yeah that's some pause I think the thing about Bach's music for me is that it's all the same thing um, he wrote a huge number of different kinds of music, um, the cantatas and the keyboard music um, and his passions, um, the B minor mass, the organ music. Um, for me, the music uh, is the same throughout, um, regardless of what he's writing for. So, um, and of course he's, known of course as the great genius of western music of the common era really um, and every single work that he wrote 
is um, really a work of genius. And um, in the organ music alone, I suppose there's more than a lifetime's worth of uh, exploration there, out there. Um, and I love performing that music because it constantly challenges me and constantly challenges audiences as well. Um, it's constantly relevant and universal in its um, uh, in its approach and its uh, effect on the listener and performer. And you know, by there's a great sense in performing this music that we as musicians and listeners we you know get better as human beings through through his music. What do I look for in new compositions? That's kind of a difficult question to answer because um, uh, when you get a new score of music, um, it's like being presented with a newborn child in a way. Um, you have to sort of disseminate and work out what the music is before you start to think about how you're gonna play it and how you're going to bring it out into the world. Um, I mean, I guess I've been lucky enough to play lots of new music that people have written for me. Um, and those people are often my friends who are um, eminent composers already. And um, I suppose I look for um, a kind of honest approach and uh, music which uh, allows me to kind of make of it what I want um, and I tend to like to not have too prescriptive a score for the organ. Um, the organ is an instrument which uh, where the organist often gets to, tran um, to orchestrate the music uh, rather than be uh, prescribed um, as to what registrations and what kind of tonal uh, palette um, the composer wants. So. The less information, the better, really. Um, but it, it is a wonderful thing to be, to you know, for a PDF to drop into your inbox and uh, for you to kind of uh, work out what it's going to be and what what life form it's going to take. And of course, that's only my take on it. And uh, the great thing about new music is that it's, um, you know, if it's worth playing, then lots of people will play it, and you'll get several different versions, lots of different interpretations of the same of the same music. And I've often been um, taken with other people's playing of those pieces that have been written for me, um, and uh, those readings have um, helped me as well. If I could work with any composer to write me a specific organ piece, dead or alive, who would I ask? Um, that's also a really difficult question. Um, I mean, Bach is a obvious uh, answer. I feel like he's written probably enough for me to be getting on with at the moment. Um, I've always been a huge admirer of the music of William Byrd, um, the 16th century English composer. And he lived through a period of time in England, in England's history, which was incredibly tumultuous and difficult. Bird was a Catholic and kept his Catholic faith throughout a period where Catholics were persecuted, um, and but managed to survive and managed to publish a huge number of huge amounts of music. Um, in fact, for the Catholic Church um, and with a royal warrant as well, um, and. I guess he would be a fascinating person to ask to write a piece for um, the combined forces of bedroom community. I think that would be really cool. Do I think there's still a religious aspect of performing organ music? Um, perhaps um, it's true that the organ is, when people hear it, it's very, very often people think of church. Um, and um, even in kind of hammer horror films, you know, there's a kind of gothic church aspect to hearing the organ in organ scores. Um, 
I don't know whether people think about church when you're in the Royal Festival Hall listening to a new piece of organ music. Um, I suspect you don't. Um, but uh, I don't think that's a particularly important um, consideration. Um, if the music's good and it's presented in an honest, curated in an honest, open way, um, I don't necessarily think that religious aspect can detract from the from the instrument itself. Um, and many of the composers who write for the organ write for religious contexts anyway. Um, it all depends on whether you think that um, there being a religious aspect to performing organ music is a problem. Um, I would say there probably is. Uh, the music of Olivier Messiaen is particularly pertinent here. I mean, he was a devout Catholic. Um, his music, um, again, rather like Bach's, is universal and unique. Um, he d designed and um, evolved a harmonic, new harmonic system um, in Western music. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to be religious to enjoy that music. Um, so yeah. How did I meet the guys from the National? Well, um, they actually came to hear me play um, in Westminster Abbey, I don't know, five years ago. Um, and uh, as with all kind of new, mu new music uh, people, new musicians in the New York scene, everyone kind of knows each other. So in fact, I met them through Nico Muley. He's one of my closest, closest and oldest friends. Um, and um, the great thing about those guys, Bryce and Aaron Desner from The National is that they're incredibly generous with their musical friendship, um, as well as their friendship, of course. Um, and uh, Bryce and I and Nico and everyone in that kind of world share this view that um, all music is the same, really, um, in my mind. You know, a bird motet is the same as a national song, which is the same as a Philip Glass ensemble piece, which is the same as a Puccini opera. It's all music um, and uh, doesn't doesn't have to exist in those uh, defined pigeonholed boxes. So, yeah, we have uh, uh, we have a lot of fun. And I just got back from Music Now, which is Bryce's wonderful festival in Cincinnati, uh, which is the band's hometown. Um, it was an amazing five days of music um, across a huge, a hugely broad um, number of genres and uh, many, many different uh, musicians from different musical backgrounds were performing. And I played some Bach on the piano. Um, Timo Andres played some of his own music and we had the National and Sufjan Stevens um, and also the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra um, curated two spectacular um, evenings in uh, the music hall and played everything from a new piece by Caroline Shaw and a new commission um, by Daniel Bjarnason um, to uh, um, music by Varese, um, his an amazing uh, score called Emerique, which finished off the evening. So it was rich and diverse in a very encouraging and satisfying way. What are my goals for the future years? Um, that's always a difficult question to ask. Um, it's a constant jugg juggling act between um, having a kind of economic base um, and kind of balancing that with um, the largest proportion of work that I really, really want to do. Um, and I guess um, planning ahead, looking at the next couple of years, I'm hoping to um or planning to uh, do as much recording as i can and um just exploring the kind of um the idea of the organ as this kind of original synthesizer idea um and i started to explore that really with cycles which was my first bedroom community album and um i have plans uh to record um uh, disc of uh, music by Philip Glass. Um, much of his music, uh, his early music, he wrote for the Philip Glass Ensemble. And um, I have this weird idea that I'm going to try and use the organ as a 
as a kind of version of that ensemble um, and produce an album of pieces that um, I probably wouldn't be able to play live. Um, but using the instrument as you would use any kind of ensemble in a studio context um, with layering and multi, uh, multi-tracking. So yeah, that's uh, one of one of my projects. And I also have um, various other commissions um, in the pipeline, um, one of which is by Bryce Dessner. He's going to write me a piece uh, for the organ, possibly with uh, him playing as well, for the two of us to play. So that's another, that's another little plan. I think that um, for many people, when they hear um, the organ for the first time, they're struck by the kind of sheer power of the instrument. And I have to say that when I was young, um, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, I remember hearing the instrument and um, I was uh, just overwhelmed by the kind of sheer noise of it. And there is a kind of um, boyish delight about the kind of the megalomania involved in it. And you can unleash all of this kind of power on a, on a building. Um, and I think that's true. I mean, it's really, it's a, an amazingly thrilling uh, instrument to play. Um, and I would, um, I mean, I would say that, that that never really goes away. It's a bit like drive, driving a really fast car. It still has this kind of adrenaline to it. Um, and of course, over time, you realize that um, as you learn the instrument and as you kind of progress and advance, you realize that there are so many other things that it can do. Um, and I think, um, you know, organs are always, um, or often rather, often uh, placed in incredible architectural spaces. So, um, I mean, I was incredibly lucky to work at St Paul's Cathedral in Westminster Abbey, two of London's great landmarks and architectural gems. And um, really to feel to feel like um, those were um, kind of part of my musical personality were really special and a huge privilege. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I know quite a lot about architecture now um, as a result of playing organs um, of the kind of uh, Gothic cathedral variety. Um, I was lucky in that... Um, Basically, all of my organ teachers um, over the years, I mean, I had, I guess, three main teachers. They were all incredibly um, demanding of me, and especially when I didn't like it very much. Um, and um, they kind of just drilled into me that, you know, I had to be as good if not better than um, everyone else um, and I think that advice um, and that kind of work ethic to be drilled into you um, at a very early age um, i.e. sort of being inspired and terrified in equal measure about performances is, in is incredibly important um, and uh, in a way, I've spent quite a lot of the more recent years trying to sort of, uh, in a way, kind of undo that and realise that um, uh, performances don't have to be quite so stressful. Um, uh, but one of the nicest things is feeling, um, feeling that you, as a musician, don't need to be taught on a regular basis anymore. And that comes after a huge number of years of study with, with one or more people. Um, I studied with Hans Fagius, who's a um, Swedish organist who was um, head of the Copenhagen Conservatoire for many years. And he really made me feel like I could stand on my own two feet, musically speaking. Um, and that was incredibly uh, empowering and and uh, useful really um, especially um, because that coincided with um, my kind of upsurge and in interest in new music and uh, commissioning new music and um, bringing new music into the world which didn't exist
Um, yes, of course. I mean, I teach at the moment. Um, and in many ways, it's interesting to be on the other side of the fence. And um, there's an amazing uh, piece of music uh, that was written for Nadia entitled In Teaching Others We Teach Ourselves. And that's um, something which I've felt very, very keenly over the last few years. And, you know, when you've got, got an inquisitive, intelligent 13 year old asking you why you've just said something that really makes you think about why you're actually saying it. Um, and so, yeah, I've learned probably as much from my pupils as I have, if not more from my pupils as I have from any teacher. Um, and yeah, it's a wonderful thing to be able to kind of uh, carry on the tradition and impart this, uh, impart all of the things that um, I've gathered with me um, over the years to these um, to these uh, young minds. I would say that Campari and soda is the best drink to drink at about four o'clock in the afternoon because it can be the end of a day, a good day's work, or it can be the beginning of a very good night. So this has been really fun. Um, thanks for asking such great questions. Um, and I'll see you at the next Bedroom Community Show. <laughs>